us now greet one another as we share the peace and joy of the risen Christ by waving or bumping elbows. <laughs> I want to invite the children to come forward as we sing Pass It On. And I believe Danny is coming up, but I don't see her yet. you guys today? Good. I'm going to show you a picture on my phone and I want you to look at it and I want you to tell me what you see in the picture. Okay? I'm going to show you guys first. Wait, see. Okay, so for those who can't see, it's the United Methodist symbol, the cross and the flame. So adults in the United Methodist Church, they kind of know that symbol because we've seen it our whole lives and we know that it represents our church and our faith and how we believe in God. And as you get older, you might hear stories about some people who don't like our symbol because they say that the cross is on fire, but it's not. I heard that growing up a lot. And what it is, is it's, it's got a cross and then it's got the flame because when Jesus died on the cross, do you know what happened? Do you know what happened? Do you know what happened? His Holy Spirit came out, right? So from Christmas time, when Jesus was born, until he dies on the cross, the Holy Spirit hasn't happened yet. Does it make sense? So there was just father and son. Jesus had to die to have the Holy Spirit take over. And sometimes you hear that as, it's called Pentecost. Have you heard of Pentecost before, where everybody wears red to church? You might not know, but that's okay. So there's this time of Pentecost, and it's when the Holy Spirit came, and all the disciples felt Jesus, and they knew he was there. And then they went out to do what Jesus had done before he died. Pretty cool, huh? And so we have a way to represent that in the church. And it doesn't matter if you go to a Catholic church, or Greek Orthodox church, or a Christian church, or a United Methodist church. They're going to have a flame somewhere. And ours is right up there. See it? It's in that red cup. And right now, it's, it's a battery-powered flame. It used to be a real candle when I was little. But now it's, now it's just on. And do you know what the only day is? Well, I'll have to ask Bev. Does it stay off? It stays off for three days, right? And then those three days till Easter. Okay, so on Good Friday, which is called the Tenebrae, when Jesus dies, the flame is out until Easter morning, and that's when he rose from the tomb. Pretty cool, huh? So, yeah. And we have other ways that we recognize the Holy Spirit. When we light the candle, the Holy Spirit comes in with us. And if you'll notice, when Gabby unlights the candles today, hopefully, as long as the candle is being nice to us, she's going to carry the flame out. And that represents that we are going to carry the light of God and carry the spirit with us as we go through our week. Make sense? Okay, so I got each of you guys a little gift to take with you. And it's a candle. And I'm going to let you pick one. Don't light it unless you have your parents. Okay? Okay. But you can light it maybe when you get home. You can stick it in something and light it and then say a prayer or something when you get home later today, okay? And I'm going to open them and you guys can pick which color you want. We'll start here and we'll go around the circle, okay? Thank you. 
beautiful, aren't they? And that kind of that kind of will remind you too. Like you don't even have to light it. I found some that actually, when you hold them up to the light, they sparkle on their own, right? And the cool thing about the Holy Spirit, I'm going to end it with this, <clears throat> is that can we see the Holy Spirit? We can in the candles, right? The Holy Spirit's always with you. It's around you. It's in you. It comes everywhere. It comes in the bad times and the good times. I think we feel it a lot better in the good times, right? We feel it easier. But it's there in the bad times too. Because we always want to remember that sometimes when there's a dark time in our life, we just need to turn our light on. And we can find happiness, right? All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, I hope that this week you can help the kiddos that came to church this morning remember to share their light in the darkness. And I hope that they take this candle with them as a reminder that no matter how dark it seems, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how hard life can be, there's always a source of light. And if they choose not to light their candle today, I hope that you keep it with them so when they need a reminder, they can pull it out and light it to remind them of you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Please stand for our gospel lesson. Hear now these words from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came near and spoke to them. I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, understanding, and doing of Scripture. Please be seated.
Thank you so much, beautiful choir. For those who know the Gospel of Matthew, and for those of us who aren't as familiar with Matthew, Matthew might be the Gospel that has most ordered the life of the church. It's a book that tells us about Jesus' family tree and how everybody, including us here today, fits into that family tree. Matthew holds a wealth of parables like the parable of the talent, of the talents that we heard last week, the parable of the pearl of great price. That's a good one, and if you don't know it, you should check it out. Matthew gives us the Beatitudes and the Lord's Prayer that we say together every Sunday. Matthew gives us Jesus' guidance to the church on how to speak our grievances how to make peace with one another. In Matthew, Jesus tells us how to find him in a crowd. Hint, look for the least of these if you want to find Jesus. Jesus tells us in Matthew how to receive the kingdom. In other words, how to live as if heaven is already right here on earth. In Matthew, Jesus says, we create heaven on earth by welcoming children and those who can't afford to come to a fancy party. Jesus says that we create heaven on earth by forgiving as we have been forgiven and by taking responsibility for harms we have caused. Jesus says in Matthew that it's by using our gifts and our talents to become the change we wish to see in the world that the, the reign of God and heaven on earth comes to be. We're together today to pray God's blessing on our congregation as we dedicate our gifts. God has given us these gifts to live out God's reign on earth as in heaven for another calendar year and beyond time, just in our daily lives, whether together as a body or wherever else we might be in the world. As Christians, we commit to live out the passage Jim read, what we call the Great Commission. The United Methodist paraphrase of the Great Commission is this, and if you know it, join it, join me by saying it to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So a United Methodist commitment is to just live our lives as if the world is being transformed, as if we are disciples. That informs so much of what we do and how we see ourselves. It's a very powerful little statement. The passage Jim read, very short, tremendously potent if we think about it. Even though we may in moments just have faith, as Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, the size of a teeny tiny mustard seed, even then, even if the money I contribute only feels like a little grain of mustard, we're here today because we trust that the God who multiplies loaves and fishes multiplies our financial gifts and our spiritual gifts to do something far beyond what we can ask or imagine. And this, I believe, is what the Great Commission is all about. As we go out into the world, we go in the confidence that the Savior who did all these things for us, taught us all these things, rose from the dead, reminds us that we're not dead, even if we feel like it. This same Savior has already shown us everything we need to know about being disciples in the world. This same Savior has shown us, if we use the language of today, how to keep 
offering our gifts to God and to each other and to the world so that the Holy Spirit can put them to good use. So that God's reign and love and grace and peace can be known here on earth as in heaven. Generosity isn't necessarily about understanding how, how all this works, but about trying to order our lives so that in relationship and humility to one another, the spirit of the living Christ can go with us and show us how to be light to each other in the world. The eternal sun, the eternal flame, the eternal gift of Jesus gives us that power to actually be Christ in the world. Remembering and remembering that love and presence of Jesus. I think that's amazing. An amazing, amazing and humbling calling that each one of us here today represents Christ and that we go out into our lives and the world and and that's our job. We're being disciples. As Danny said, being the light, remembering the light. I heard a great story the other day that helped me let go a little bit more of some of my fears and live a little more into the joy that living the reign of God on earth as in heaven brings and can bring. And so here is the story. It is told by Adrian Marie Brown, who is an author and is known as by a term that she invented called emergent strategist. And this story is one she told in an interview she did from a podcast called Emergent Strategy. Adrian had a tortoise. She still does, but for the purpose of the story, she had a tortoise. And she watched this tortoise grow up from a tiny baby turtle into a bigger tortoise, and now an even bigger tortoise that can walk out the door by itself to play outside. Adrian was concerned, and before the point of this story, had never let the turtle walk outside all by itself to play unsupervised in the yard. But on the day of this particular experience, the turtle was just out in the yard, and Adrian was sitting in her home getting a haircut. And the haircut was happening in such a way that as it started to rain outside, Adrian realized she couldn't just hop up and go get her turtle, her tortoise. So she decided to sit there, even though it was hard for her, watching the rain beginning to pour down outside while her hairstylist continued to cut her hair. She was a little freaked out. She was worried about this baby she had put so much of her time and attention into that she had seen grow from tiny. And as she sat there, forcing herself to just kind of be present and relax, she noticed that as it was raining more and more, what she expected to tur the turtle to do was the opposite of what happened. She had expected her tortoise to just clam up in its shell. But do you know what it was doing instead? Can anybody guess? It was splashing in the puddles. It was drinking the rain. Her tortoise was having a wonderful time. This was a turning point for her something she had invested herself in, something that kind of, I, she does not have children, and I don't presume to speak for her, but something that kind of was an external representation of the care and love she had to give in the world. She was letting it go free. It was going to come back inside, but she was just watching it. And the joy, even the ecstasy she felt watching that turtle Drinking the rain is an image I want to keep with me as I think about the Great Commission and as I think about being disciples of Jesus. 
if the church is a gathered body of believers with or without a building, the church is also the tortoise. And as a people, we the church are having to go into some new places that maybe we have not been before. And maybe we're having to build our trust muscles that the church is not only what happens in the building. I know in theory we know that because we're really good at going out and serving places and doing all sorts of wonderful things. But what if the church is the tortoise and together as a body, we're being invited to drink the rain and to dance in the puddles and to remember that we're disciples we're Jesus' disciples as we do this. We're talking this final Sunday of our generosity series about leaving a legacy. And in some ways, I think these are kind of difficult days to think about leaving not necessarily a financial legacy, because we're definitely talking about that. But we also think about what it means to leave an ethical legacy, kind of a living reminder to people of the values we wish to share with others, like Jesus does in the Great Commission. That's one example of Jesus sharing his legacy with us. All that I've known, I, I've been given all authority, and I give that to you, and I promise to be with you, but kind of like in the Lorax, here, it's on you now that gracious act of surrender, I know for me that's super hard, and that's why I need the turtle drinking the rain. May we find joy in our discipleship. May we find joy in our generosity. May we find joy in the future God holds for us and with us, even if we don't know it. Now, I've done something very silly, and I would be so happy if you would join me in this act of play. I'm going to compare it to the dancing in the rain. It's not raining in here now, but we can still play in the rain. Who knows Queen's song, We Will Rock You? Raise your hand. Okay, we have enough people who know it that I trust you will be able to keep the rhythm because I know I cannot. All right, so your job is to tap, tap, clap, tap, tap, clap, wherever you are. And then your job at the right time is to sing, we are your disciples. We are your disciples. Okay, hold that. Keep the rhythm. I'm going to sing, look out, you're going to respond at the right time with you, with you know what. Okay, keep it going. Jesus born of Mary, your people on the prairie, thank you for your love and for showing us there's room for everyone under the sun. Kingdom life is so much fun singing. Gave the Great Commission, sorry, I'm nervous. Gave the Great Commission, sent your people fishing, call the little children to come to you. Sometimes we forget when we're down in the pit, your grace will get us out of it. Singing, we are your disciples. We are your disciples. Now we live by your prayer, trusting that you're there, sharing our gifts out in the world. In our generosity, we find who we're meant to be. You call us to live joyfully, singing, we are your disciples. We are your disciples. Thank you.
<laughs> Let us pray together. Whether in joy or in struggle or in joyful struggle, you are with us, O oh God. You go with us into the future. You honor our commitments. And you multiply our gifts as you multiply loaves and fishes. Hear our prayers today in this moment, in this very room. Some of us carry heavy burdens. Lighten our loads, O oh Christ. Some of us are bursting with joy. Amplify this gladness, O oh Christ. Some of us are seeking the next right thing to do. Guide our feet. Guide our hearts. Guide our brains and our guts and our lives, O oh Christ. We pray with those who are in sorrow. We pray with all who are on the journey of healing. We pray with those who do not have enough. And we pray with those who have too much. We pray with the lonely ones, the anxious ones, the hurting ones, the depressed and disenchanted ones. O oh Christ, May we share your light with one another this day, this night, and in the week to come. In gratitude and hope, we sing the prayer you taught us to pray. Good morning. Good morning. I want to talk a little bit uh, this morning about uh, legacy giving, uh, kind of a, a postseason of generosity, if you will. Uh, a lot of us are uh, already familiar with uh, the concept of estate planning, and a lot of us, especially older ones like myself, uh, have estate plans in place. Uh, but uh, estate planning is really important for everyone, regardless of uh, age and uh, regardless of wealth, uh, anyone with any material possessions or financial assets has an estate. And estate planning is about uh, controlling how your estate is given to the people or organizations that you care about after our deaths. And hopefully one of these organizations is West Heights. Uh, we can support our church and its ministries uh, beyond our lifetimes by including West Heights in our wills or trusts, uh, making West Heights a beneficiary of an uh, insurance policy or an IRA or whatever, uh, your financial advisor or uh, estate planning attorney can help you decide what makes the most sense for your individual circumstances. Uh, a lot of us end up uh, after our deaths with a uh, large enough estate that we could make a bequest to the church uh, way beyond what uh, we could through our normal income stream during our lifetimes. So this postseason of generosity can really make a significant impact. 
uh, unless uh, it's otherwise directed, uh, major requests to the church uh, go to the West Heights United Methodist Church Foundation. We haven't done a real good job lately publicizing it, but the foundation's been around for uh, over 30 years, and uh, it was established to uh, grow and maintain an endowment fund for long-term uh, support to the church. Uh, beyond, you know, what we can do with our normal uh, budget, normal annual pledge drive. Uh, all the gifts to the foundation are invested and a portion of the earnings are used to fund specific projects. Uh, past few years, as we all know, have been pretty tough financially uh, with uh, not much uh, in the regular budget beyond the bare necessities but you've probably seen some things happen uh, that uh, you might wonder how we were able to do it. Uh, the foundation has been able to fund uh, a lot of those. Uh, some of the things the foundation has funded in the past couple of years include the uh, Breaking the Stigma Project, uh, some much needed uh, security, IT, and audiovisual upgrades, the, a new piano dolly, uh, new carpeting in the office area, and a uh, portion of the uh, playground resurfacing that was not funded by a federal grant. Uh, most recently, uh, the foundation funded the uh, major repair of the air conditioning system. Uh, we're uh, also considering uh, funding a much needed restroom upgrade. Uh, your legacy gifts to the foundation will be used as you intended. You can designate them uh, as uh, to uh, building, uh, youth, uh, uh, worship and music, uh, other missions and ministry, or they can be undesignated. Uh, you can make the donation to the area that most interests you, or you could uh, start a brand new endowment fund within the foundation. So today uh, we're pledging our uh, support to the general budget during the coming year, but would ask that you uh, also prayerfully consider a postseason of generosity by uh, continuing your financial support of our church through your estate plans. Thank you, Kurt. I would like to invite Mike Patton, our finance chair, to join me here. In a moment, as we sing the doxology, our pledge forms will be brought to the front for blessing. If you would like to fill out a pledge form, we have them in the narthex. You can take them with you today. You can go get one now. You can hold your pledge form in your hands if you have it with you as we bless them and then leave it in the offering plate. The options are endless. Mike, I welcome you to share some words with us. Uh, again, Mike Patton, with the uh, chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, I want to thank Kurt for, for kind of wrapping up uh, our uh, six month, excuse me, six week uh, uh, generosity campaign, which has been centered on seasons of generosity. And as we go through life from children, when we, you know, put our nickels or dimes when I was a kid or dollars in the plate to, uh, you know, being youth, to uh, having a young family, to being a mature family, and then later in life. Each one of those seasons of generosity is different, but uh, most all of you have been along on all of those seasons. Uh, we've explored the ways that we express our generosity through the various seasons uh, by committing to the operations of this church and to its missions. And uh, I, I want to thank each and every one of you for your kindness and your discipline in giving to this congregation and this community uh, through your pledges. Um, the gifts that you uh, make of your presence, your talents, your time, and your treasure uh, make this community uh, a special place, uh, one that would, uh, you know, be uh, a part of the uh, Great Commission that we have that uh, Bev talked to us about today. Um, and I want you to know that, you know, what we pledge today will affect what we do next year. 
It will be the operations uh, funds that will uh, support our mission and our congregation. So uh, we ask that you think very prayerfully about the, uh, the commitment that you will make this Sunday. And, uh, and final, I'd like to say, may the abundance of God's generosity in our lives be a blessing to others through the way we share our resources. Amen. Mike and I will remain together to offer the blessing um, as we sing the doxology now together. I invite you to stand as the blessing, as the commitment cards are brought in. Let's sing. do, I invite you to join us in extending hands toward these gifts. Let's pray together. We, we believe, believe in God, God, most high God, who strengthens us and repays us more times than, than we expect. We, we believe in God, who gives generously and who expects the same from all creatures God has made. We believe in God, whose utmost loving sacrifice is experienced through Jesus Christ, who paid it all. We believe that Jesus Christ consciously and lovingly emptied himself so that we may learn to make sacrifices and live joyfully before God. And so in that same spirit, we dedicate these gifts in Jesus' name through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Before we sing our closing hymn, our closing song, we have one more little education piece. As you might remember, or maybe you don't know, this past month, we've been considering all the different little parts of worship in the service. We started with the coming together, the gathering, and we moved to um, the call to worship. We talked about the sermon time. We talked about the response time. We talked about hearing God's word through Holy Scripture. And last week, we talked about responding to God's call, kind of that Point, that turning point in the service that begins with the Lord's Prayer and the offering and then moves toward the sending. And that's our last movement of worship this morning. We're going to sing a song based on the Great Commission called As We Go. And so as we get ready to sing As We Go, we remember again that we are sent. God sends us into the world to be the light of Christ to one another, to those around us. We are God's disciples. Let's remember that as we go today. And so now, please stand for our closing song.
the light. Go in Christ's peace and power. Amen. Thank you.